Okay, okay, we're gonna go live now and open the webinar. We are definitely live now. Welcome friends, we'll get started momentarily as we let folks filter into the room. Welcome, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm putting in the chat a link to today's document, which will contain links to library resources, as well as links to our panel and the SF environment, as well as a link to today's YouTube recording if you'd like to watch it again, or any of our Climate Action Month events that we've had with SF Environment are all on our YouTube channel. And all of the events we've done since Shelter in Place pretty much. So check out the YouTube, it's very robust. Um, We've had amazing folks like Angela Davis, um, Chanel, oh, Chanel Miller's not on there, but we did have her. Um, so definitely go seek out our YouTube channel. We'll give it just a moment for folks to fill in before I give my library announcements. All right, welcome friends. Today you are here for a panel discussion about edible food recovery during COVID-19. And this is a continued partnership with the San Francisco Department of Environment. And as I mentioned, this will be available again on YouTube. We'd like to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we work and reside here in the Bay Area. We welcome you to put in the chat what native land you belong to. And I'll, I'll in a bit put a, I'm gonna put it right now. If you don't know what land you're from, you can use this map to find out. It's a very interesting map. Um, we also want to acknowledge the horrendous violence against our uh, Asian and Asian American communities. And we stand in solidarity with those communities and the library is not a neutral institution. We want to acknowledge that the entanglement of anti-Black and anti-Asian stereotypes all uphold white supremacy and that we believe everyone has a stake in dismantling white supremacy. Um, let's see, uh, we have a lot going on at the library. If you haven't heard, we are reopening very, very soon, May 3rd. But the pandemic is still happening, so don't forget to wear your masks and protect all my library family out there and all of our families and friends working in the streets and serving the city. Um, I mentioned uh, we have been partnering with SF Environment. We had a great Earth Day program on Thursday night, which you should catch on YouTube. Um, Jane Kim and Thayer Walker of Inkdwell Studio. So amazing couple and all of their work was great and they did a great presentation. So go seek that out. I'll put the link in the chat in a bit. On Wednesday, next Wednesday, we have essayist, poet, cultural critic, Hanif Abderqweep in conversation with our poet laureate, Tongo Eisen Martin, discussing Abderqweep's new book, A Little Devil in America, a partnership with Moad. And we, I can't even believe it's May, but it is May, like just right around the corner. And we'll be celebrating AAPI month. And I concentrate mostly on adult programs, but we have all gender, intergenerational programming happening at the library virtually. So I will breeze through these. I might stop at a few that I really am excited about, a partnership with Kearney Street Workshop. Um, author, poet, Mariel Luong will be presenting her new book along with a whole group of poets. So please come check that one out. Martin Yan. Um, Tresse is a graphic novel that's been, just been optioned for Netflix. And the good thing about, uh, one of the good things about sheltering in place and doing virtual programming is we get to bring folks from all over the place, which is an example today as well. Um, but artist and author, one from Holland, one from uh, the Philippines. So these are, is gonna be amazing. And like I said, I'm breezing through these, but you get the idea that we have a ton of events happening throughout May. And throughout summer, we're about ready to launch Summer Stride as well. Uh, Heather Knight and Peter Hartlob from SF Chronicle and Total SF Podcast are now 
doing a quarterly book club with us and we're launching it off with Home Baked, our own Aaliyah Voles and talking about her mom, Marijuana and the Stoning of San Francisco. Amazing book, it's got humor, but it also has some deep SF history involved. Our on the same page author for May is Vanessa Hua. If you're not familiar with on the same page, it's where we try to get the entire city to read the same book at the same time. Come out to the author talk and come out to the book club. Um, it's really, the book clubs have been a really great way to reconnect with our community. So please join us. Um, if you don't follow Chinatown Pretty on Instagram, I encourage you to do so. Amazing photos of stylish, stylish and wise um, elder, elders of Chinatown. All right, and now today, along with the SF Environment, we present a panel of amazing organizations who are recovering edible food for people in the community who need it most. And I'm gonna pass it off to Soko Maid of the SF Environment. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Anissa. So many exciting things going on at the library. Give me a moment while I share my screen with you all. Okay. And present mode. Come on. All right. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Again, I am Soko Made with the Department of the Environment. And today I have my colleague, Alexa Kilty, and we will be talking about how zero waste is connected to food recovery and food waste prevention. Um, but to start off, um, as I said, we're with the San Francisco Department of the Environment and our mission is to provide solutions that advance climate protection and enhance the quality of life for all San Franciscans. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Alexa is gonna go through a zero waste overview, why we're tackling food waste prevention and food recovery. And then we're gonna have four amazing organizations share what they have been doing in this realm. I am really excited because some of these I do know, but didn't know the extent of work that they were doing. So I think this is great that we understand what's going on in San Francisco. We will have um, questions, Q and A afterwards. Um, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A portion or in the chat, and we will try and have someone respond to you. If we don't get to it in the chat, then we will definitely have um, verbal responses, and then we will have closing remarks. So, with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague Alexa to start. Hi everyone, I'm Alexa Kelty. I'm the Residential Zero Waste uh, Senior Coordinator at Department of the Environment. I work with SOCO and I'm super excited to be here with you all to talk about one of my favorite subjects. But I wanted to uh, create a little bit of groundwork for you all to understand how this fits into the city's overall goals. Um, as many of you know, uh, the city of San Francisco is striving towards zero waste. And we had a zero waste by 2020 goal that we did not meet. Um, so more recently, we've sort of shifted our, our, our priorities um, where we still wanna cut landfilling in half by 50%, but we also included an additional piece. We wanna reduce what we call generation. So we want to reduce what we're putting in the compost bin, the recycling bin, and the landfill bin by 15% because we know we're not going to meet, meet our climate goals um, by just recycling and composting alone. And we've also discovered there's a lot of edible food going in our compost. Next slide, please. So to give a little background, um, some of you may have heard about 40% of all the food grown in the US or raised, including meat, um, is landfilled or wasted in some capacity. That's a huge amount of food. And that means greenhouse gases are being emitted through that process. They're saying it's about um, 18 million tons of greenhouse gases are emitted from our wasted food. And much of that is edible. So we know, and recently with the COVID pandemic, um, I talked with our partners, SF Food Bank, and they were serving about 30,000 families every week who were uh, 
food insecure uh, prior to COVID. And then since COVID started, those numbers went up to 50 to 60,000 um, families in, in San Francisco every week. So the need is huge. We all know this um, and it's going up around us. Um, so what, what is San Francisco doing, the Department of the Environment around this? Um, go ahead, next slide. So there's sort of two prongs. We want to reduce wasted food, right? We shouldn't be producing and purchasing food that we don't need over production. Um, I'm sure you all have seen it at the, the university cafeterias or tech cafeterias where there's abundance of food being produced that's not necessarily being consumed. So we want to, we call that food waste prevention. The other arm we want to maximize is food rescue and food donation. Um, one of the partnerships we've joined is the Pacific Coast Collaborative. Um, this was started by Governor Brown with the goal of re reducing greenhouse gases. And there's a number of different uh, program areas. I work with the Food Waste Reduction Group. So we've partnered with uh, British Columbia, Vancouver, uh, Washington, Seattle, Oregon, Portland, um, state of California. Oakland recently joined, we're super excited. Um, Stop Waste, Alameda County and Los Angeles and of course uh, San Francisco. Um, the goal is to approach supermarkets and other um, uh, supply chain generators of food and ask them to join our goal of 50% food waste reduction by 2030. And it basically is an opportunity to collaborate with supermarkets to reduce that food in a non-competitive atmosphere. Um, and they're, they're sharing their data with us. We've partnered with ReFed is a fantastic group working in this space. Um, World Wildlife Fund, if you didn't know, is doing a huge amount of work in the food space because they know wildlife um, need land. And right now we're cultivating a lot of the land that could be used as habitat and that food is then getting wasted. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's all the jurisdictions involved that I mentioned um, working towards this goal. Next slide, please. We're also working with the state of California in uh, 2020. Um, state of California passed a short-lived climate pollutant um, bill, SB 1383. Um, the big summary I'll give you, there's a lot in that bill, but basically it's requiring all large generators of food to donate their, their food to people in need and that has to be tracked. So Department of the Environment is going to be working with all these large generators. When I say large generators, I mean big, huge kitchens, institutions, hospitals um, that are generating a lot of food and we're gonna be tracking their donations. So that's super exciting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, received a grant from CalRecycle about two years ago for $500,000. We were super excited to install food waste tracking and donation software. So there's three partners we're working with, Lean Path, Copia, and Replay. I encourage you all to check them out. Um, they, they do some great work around um, matching donations. So if a food generator has something they want to donate, they can put it in this app and the app automatically connects it to a organization in need. And so that way we're not donating or dumping food on organizations that won't be able to consume it. And then Lean Path is more food waste reduction focused. So upstream, they're, they're looking at how do, how do chefs uh, maximize their ordering or reduce their ordering so they don't have waste to begin with. Uh, next slide, please. So next steps forward um, for uh, Department of the Environment, we definitely are gonna be looking at legislation, how to support the, the state bill I mentioned. And um, I'm really interested in potentially, um, you know, mandating certain types of software um, that require um, maximizing donation and food waste prevention for certain generators. So there, there's a lot of pathways forward, but we know <clears throat> this is critical if you all, um, uh, follow climate issues at all. We, we all know food waste is like close to the top of the list and what we can do to uh, preserve our climate. So now I wanted to hand it off to all of our fantastic partners who are doing a lot of the work on the ground. We really appreciate you.
Great, thank you so much, Alexa. Great overview of what we're doing at the department in terms of food waste prevention and food recovery. And so now I wanna turn it over to our wonderful organizations today who are gonna tell us about what they're doing. And we're gonna start with Olio. Next slide. Uh, hi, and our, hi, hi, Anne Charlotte. So quick intro to Olio. Anne Charlotte Mornington was introduced to Olio a few months off to its inception and has been part of the team ever since. Her focus is on international expansion, partnership, and special projects. After instigating Olio communities in Sweden, California, and Mexico, she recently obtained an Innovate UK grant to develop food poverty map to local authorities address to help local authorities address the rising challenges connected to hunger and during the pandemic. So I will turn it over to you and Charlotte. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe if we can, sh should I tell you next slide every time we, okay, so perfect. Um, great, so uh, as uh, Soko just um, said, I'm gonna tell you about Olio. Uh, I totally understand that this has, this presentation has a specific focus to COVID-19 and to how solutions have been able to work in the adversity and the challenges represented by COVID-19. But with Olio, we've actually seen a threefold increase in engagement in our, in our platform. So what I'm gonna tell you about is really about the platform itself and what are the small amendments we've made, but mostly the platform has stayed and um, as it is and as it was prior to the pandemic. Um, so next slide, please. So I'll start with the, the story of how did Olio come about? So um, perhaps some of you have never heard of Olio, I presume. Um, what is the, what was the aha moment? So the lady on the right is Tessa Cook. She's the CEO. And as she was moving back from Swi living in Switzerland, she was moving back to the UK and she was packing all her boxes. And as she was packing, uh, the removal man told her she couldn't put any food in the boxes. And that was something that was completely um, unexpected to Tessa because she thought that it would, you know, that's how she was gonna put her food away. Um, so she panicked, she grabbed her toddler and her newborn and tried to like give away the food in her local community. Uh, long story short, she failed. She ended up going back and smuggling some of the food in the boxes while the removal man was not looking. And as she was doing this, she realized that perhaps what she was doing was slightly illegal, but somehow it felt much worse to her to have to throw away food than to put it um, in, the, um, in the bin. Um, so that's how uh, she thought that there was a problem here, that you know she should have found a way that was easier to just give away this perfectly edible food. So when she came back to the UK, she told Sasha, the lady who's on the right, uh, about the story. And they started investigating um, the issue of food waste. Uh, so two slides uh, forward, please. And as they investigated, unfortunately, one slide more, uh, the information that they found was absolutely horrific. Uh, some of it was just um, described in the introduction, so I apologize if there's a bit of a repeat. But um, globally, one third of all food produced doesn't get eaten, which means that when this one third of all food produced doesn't get eaten, all the resources injected in producing this food also goes to waste. So that's 25% of the world's fresh water consumption. That's all the packaging, all the transport, all the labor, all of it, which um, is a, an absolute tragedy. So we know that there's tremendous amounts of food being wasted. Next slide, please. Um, but the other thing that we know is that there's also tremendous amounts of hunger in the world. Uh, globally, there's 800 million people who are uh, living in food insecurity. That's one out of nine of every single one of us. And um, they could all be fed with less than a quarter of the food that's being wasted in the Western world, which is pretty striking. And I think it's quite easy. I mean, it was said in the introduction, but for many, it's easy to think that food poverty is something that happens like far away in, in countries that are less stable or have less development, but that's totally not the case. Um, in the UK, we have 8.4 million people suffering from food insecurity, and that's a piece of data that's pre-COVID, so I'm sure it's grown. And that's exactly the, well, very close to the population of people in London, which is the UK's biggest capital city. Um, so that's a lot of people uh, struggling. Uh, next slide, please. 
So it doesn't really make sense. So we know that there's a lot of it. We know that it could all be consumed. But to make matters worse, food waste is also an absolute tragedy for the environment. If food waste was a country, it would be third in place in terms of uh, green gas emissions just after the US and China, which is really um, quite something. The um, reason for this is that when food is wasted and ends up in landfills, it creates methane. And methane is 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to make matters worse, so I, I'm aware I've shared like pretty bad stats with you, but to make matters worse, as the population is growing, uh, the number of people that will be in the world or predicted to be in the world by 2050 would require us, if we keep on consuming at our current rate, to increase our food production by 50%. And right now we have absolutely no idea how we would be able to do this. So we're really on the cusp of being in a world where there's too much food, so much so that people put it in the bin, to a world where there isn't enough food. And that obviously is a very um, serious issue that we need to all be considering. Next slide, please. So um, this is all pretty depressing but I've kept the worst part for, or the best part uh, for last, is that uh, in the Western world, well over 50% of all food that's wasted, it's in the home. So well over 50% of the whole issue is caused by every single one of us in this call and every single household in the Western world. So while we are half the problem, we can also be half the solution. And this is why we came up with a nap that would allow individuals and households to be the solution that they might want to see. So Olio is a really simple platform that allows individuals to share any unwanted resources. Our main focus is on food, but it also works for non-food. All you need to do, if ever you want to use it, is snap a picture of whatever item you want to give away or food, food item, write a description and submit it. This way, anyone in your local community who has the app will get a notification saying, Paula is giving away a pineapple and uh, you, you can message Paula and go get the pineapple. And that's as easy as it is. Um, next slide, please. And so how is Olio doing and how is this proposition of free sharing um, growing? Well, we started in 2015 uh, in a very small um, neighborhood in London and progressively uh, opened it up to eventually being a global um, offer. Um, and we now have 4 million Olioers using the app, which we're tremendously proud of. Next slide, please. And uh, this means that we've managed to have over 18 million portions of food being shared. That's the equivalent of 52 million car miles taken off the road, which we're obviously extremely proud about. But arguably, what is the also, equity as important is what happens when an exchange takes place. And this has happened a little bit less during COVID, but is still an important part of our proposition is the communities that are built. Because when those 18 million portions of food are being shared, it means that there's been over, I think, 6 million, if the number is updated in my mind, door to door meetings or exchanges, which means that individuals in the local community start meeting and talking with each other and creating links, which is really, really important to foster communities, support and avoid loneliness, which we are suffering from more than ever um, at this point. Next slide, please. And this would really not have been possible without our ambassador growth led model, which is whereby anyone who has heard of the app so far and felt like it was a project they wanted to bring to their community has reached out to us. We've given them some materials and information about the app so that they could, in their own community, start spreading the word. And this has, there's over 40,000 of them right now, globally, spreading the world in their community and trying to make Olio thrive. And really, we wouldn't have achieved that success without the help of those ambassadors. Next slide, please. So Olio's vision is a pretty bold one. We hope to have billions of hyperlocal sharing communities all over the world so that supply can meet demand and that our most precious resources can never go to waste again. Next slide, please. And 
Oh, the one before. Uh, yes, that one. And so um, here you can see some of the pictures of our volunteers collecting food. They're all using face masks. So the type of uh, amendments that we've made during the um, pandemic is having a no contact pickup. Um, there's been quite a few publications on um, COVID not being transmittable through food packaging. So what people have done is leaving food in front of their homes or in a safe place just before the person coming to pick it up comes. Uh, so that there's a no contact pickup and that, you know, the exchange can happen very safely. Uh, we've also um, heavily encouraged and uh, provided guidance on wearing masks and um, being as careful as possible to not have contacts or make the community vulnerable in any way. Uh, the quote here is also something that highlights the um, power of the community and how being able to support each other through technology has changed a lot of people's life. In this case, someone who used to suffer from homelessness was um, was helped and supported by our local community of Food Waste Heroes who could um, help supply food and, and support to this individual. Next slide, please. So I'd like to leave everyone with uh, Dr. Jane Goodall's quote, which I think is very inspiring. Uh, I like to envision the world as a jigsaw puzzle. If you look at the whole picture, it's overwhelming and terrifying. But if you work on your little part of the jigsaw and know that people all over the world are working on their little bits, that's what will give you hope. Um, that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you will all download the app and start sharing your surplus. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Charlotte for sharing your story with us. Um, just so amazing to hear what's going on around the world. So next up, we have Move for Hunger. And our presenter from Move for Hunger is Adam Lowy. Adam is a fourth generation mover whose family has owned a moving company for nearly 100 years. After seeing so much food go to waste, he launched Move for Hunger to mobilize moving and relocation companies to rescue food during the move. To date, Move for Hunger has delivered over 22 million pounds of food to food banks, enough to provide more than 18 million meals to individuals in need. Adam proudly represents the New York City hub of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers community, where attended which attended the, um, the forum's annual meeting in Davos 2015. In 2014, he was honored among Forbes 30 under 30. In 2011, he was honored at the VH1 Do Something Awards for his commitment to creating social change. Um, so with that, I will give you the floor, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, you can head over to, yeah. Um, as you heard, my name is Adam Lowy. I have been in the moving business longer than I've wanted to be. Um, I grew up on a moving truck because that's what you do when dad owns a moving company. And for those of you that have never worked on a moving truck, I do not recommend it. Don't do it. It's not fun. Um, but at a very young age, I kind of learned the power of uh, hard work and, and got an appreciation for the industry. Um, and you can head to the next slide. Over you know generations of moving, um, we found that when people moved, they threw away a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, food, clothing, furniture, you name it, and Charlotte noticed it as well. Um, and, you know, really what we were seeing happen every day was customers were asking, what should I do with this food? Um, you feel guilty about throwing it away, um, but also when you're moving, it's a little bit crazy. So no one really wants to go through that hassle. So we started asking people if they wanted to donate their food when they moved. Um, that was all this was meant to be. I didn't, you know, think I was going to launch a nonprofit organization. We were just trying to do a good thing. Uh, switch slides. Um, and in a month from doing nothing more than asking a simple question, we collected 300 pounds of food. Um, basically customers got super excited about it. People want to do good. They don't know how, but you have to make it easy. In this case, we were bringing food drives into people's living rooms each and every day. Uh, we brought that food to our local food bank. Next slide. Um, and that was really the first time I learned about hunger in my community. I took a tour of my local food bank um, and they told me that there were 140,000 people uh, just in my community that didn't have enough to eat. Um, and up to that point, hunger was a problem that was maybe very far away in my mind, maybe in a different country or a big city. Um, but I'm from Monmouth County, New Jersey, home of Bruce Springsteen and Bon Jovi. I mean, if you look around, you don't see a lot of poverty or homelessness. Um, you don't see all the stereotypical things people think about when they think about hunger and food insecurity. Um, next slide. Uh, but as I did more research, 
Um, I realize that hunger and food insecurity really touch every single community, not just uh, here in the United States, but, but across the globe. Um, and as you do more research, you know, it's one in five people in San Francisco, one in seven children domestically go to bed, not knowing where their next meal is coming from. Um, and I realized kind of in that moment that there's so much more that we need to do. Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into a ton of uh, stats on food waste today because we've got a ton of other panelists that are going to uh, give you a really great definition of that. Um, but while so many people are struggling, we are wasting a ton of food. Um, there should not be this food loss, if you will, this food waste, especially from the home when so many people are going to bed hungry each night. Um, next slide, please. So for me, it was really uh, getting that realization that A, people were struggling locally and then it became a, a national issue. Um, and then also understanding that food waste was an issue. And uh, education became a really important part of what we're doing at Move for Hunger because you cannot fix problems unless you know they exist. So we wanna educate people at that local level um, because when you take a big problem like hunger or food insecurity in the United States, it's 45 million people um, struggling with food insecurity, which is up from 37 million, by the way, which is the number we were at pre-COVID. Um, so, but when you take a big number like that, it seems almost unsolvable. But when you shrink it down to your community and then you give people really easy ways to take action, whether it be through Move for Hunger or some of the other examples you hear today, it all of a sudden becomes, you know what, we can tackle this, we can fix this. There's no reason that hunger or food waste should really persist um, in these communities. Next slide, please. Um, so the idea of Move for Hunger was really simple. Uh, really, what we did was we teamed up with moving companies. We encouraged them to educate their clients about the need and basically offer the service to their customer to encourage them to donate their food when they move. Um, we only rescued non-perishable food items from the home. They picked the food up, they brought it to the warehouse, and once a month, they brought it back to a local food bank in their community. So the food always stayed local. Um, across California, we've delivered more than 1.5 million pounds of food um, over the past decade. I think last year we collected it enough to feed over 100,000 people in the state of California alone. Um, next slide, please. Um, to do this, we created a really simple process. Um, so you can see a sample of our educational letter. We provided a how-to guide. We sent out welcome kits, but then we also gamified the experience. Um, pitting moving companies and van lines neck uh, against each other to see who could collect the most food. Uh, head over to the next slide as well. Um, and then we also uh, teamed up with the leaders in the space, right? So all there's different trade associations and van lines you've probably heard of, Allied or North American uh, van lines. Um, so many different moving associations. The California Moving and Storage Association. Yes, there are moving associations and they are awesome. By the way, if you're ever looking for professional movers, they're, they're a great place to go to. Um, and uh, basically we got this entire industry involved because we said, this is the thing that everyone should be doing. Um, and as we started collecting more food and we started talking to food banks, um, we realized that there were a lot of similarities. Next slide, please. Um, as you talk to a lot of the nation's food banks, they'll tell you, um, you know, that they're using warehouses, they're using trucks, they're using crews. Um, a lot of the things that are here uh, that, that food banks are using are also happening that uh, are also resources that moving companies have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and one of the biggest costs for food banks and pantries is transportation. So um, it's not just an issue when we're talking about food uh, banks and distributing food to individuals in need, but it's also a pretty big issue when we're talking about food recovery. Transportation is hard, logistics is challenging, it is expensive, um, it is one of the ways that food is wasted when it's going long distance. Um, there are so many transportation and logistical challenges to getting food to where it needs to go, whether that be from the farm um, to the distributor, to the grocery store, to the home, or from or into the food bank and then out to some of the smaller agencies and pantries to where it needs to be. Next slide. So really what Move for Hunger was doing was just connecting the dots. Um, we expanded from there to go beyond moving companies. Uh, next slide, you can go actually two slides if you'd like. Um, and we started teaming up with apartment communities um, because 74% of people move without a moving company. So we were missing a huge percent of the demographic. And we actually piloted uh, our, our multifamily program in Seattle with just 10 properties, collected about 1200 pounds of food um, just over a, a few months. Um, and basically what happened is if you're living in any apartment community that we're working with currently, 
um, move for, when you give your notice that you're moving out, you'll receive a paper recyclable food collection bag. You can leave your food in there. And then we will have our transportation partners pick that food up on a monthly basis, regular basis, get that food out to local food banks. Uh, we have more than 130 apartment communities that we're working with across the state of California, uh, about 300 apartments uh, nationwide, which um, translates to 300,000 individual units. So really it's not just about rescuing and recovering this food, which is certainly a big part of it, but it's also about educating all these people, people that did not sign up for a food bank's mailing list, people that aren't interested in food waste or hunger relief necessarily, but now they all get a taste of this. Now they're all learning what the need is and how they can get involved. Uh, next slide. We also provided um, our multifamily partners with very similar letters um, to again, educate and make the process easy. At the end of the day, it needs to be easy for the customer, i.e. you listening in on this call today, uh, but it also has to be easy for the companies that are participating because if it's hard, if it's extra work, if it is not creating value, um, for-profit companies are gonna stop doing it. So process for us has always been really important. We wanna ensure that everybody, every piece of the supply chain feels really fluid. So you're creating value for the customer, the company, and ultimately the community as well. Um, you can head to the next slide. Uh, similarly to what we did with the moving industry, we also started partnering with all the big names in the multifamily space. Um, so a number of uh, the, the larger and uh, mid-range property management companies, actually just on Earth Day, uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago, the, the week is blurring, COVID has blurred all sense of days of the week for me. Um, but just on Earth Day, we launched a new partnership with Cortland uh, Partners, um, who has almost two, 200 apartment communities across the country. And they have made the commitment to make that move out process more sustainable to recover food. So you might not think of in the past, moving companies, van lines, apartments, necessarily caring about food waste, but we're, we're changing that narrative. We're changing the way that these companies operate to incorporate it into their process. Um, and what's always so exciting uh, with Move for Hunger, uh, for me anyway, is it's not about creating an organization that's gonna be around for a hundred years. It's about changing the process. So if we shut our doors tomorrow, you're still gonna have companies out there that are recovering food and getting it to local food banks and pantries. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, uh, over the past 12 years, we've grown our network from one moving company to 1,100. We've got 1,200 apartment communities. We work with corporate partners. We do uh, food drives, fundraisers. We have a race team. Collectively, we've delivered more than 22 million pounds of food, feeding more than 18 million people. And COVID, um, you know, if you watched some of those uh, really horrible news uh, stories of food rotting out in the fields on so many farms. Um, we began working with some refrigerated transportation companies, as well as using our non-refrigerated uh, resources for some short distance hauls of food. And last year, we uh, actually were able to deliver more than 300,000 pounds of fresh food, um, which is up from the 60,000 pounds of fresh we had done just the year prior. Um, so fresh food was not where we started, um, but we're seeing a real opportunity here and we're planning to continue to explore opportunities to um, get more fresh, nutritious, healthy foods um, that would have gone to waste into the hands of the people that need it most. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you that are listening in today, uh, there's plenty of ways to get involved. I did not list them all, all out on this slide, but if you're ever interested in holding a food drive, we got you. We'll do the heavy lifting from the flyers creative campaigns and ultimately delivering that food, picking it up in our, one of our trucks and getting it to a local food bank in your community. Uh, we have fundraisers, we have a team move for hunger. Um, if you are moving, you can find a socially responsible professional moving company on our find a mover tool on the website. Um, and if you're living in our, our apartment community, you can also donate your food when you move out there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more, please visit moveforhunger.org. Um, and that's where you can learn more about the, all the great things our organization is doing. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, excited to share a little bit more about what Move for Hunger is doing to fight hunger and food waste. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, this is just great information. I never had actually thought about moving companies being able to move food. Um, so this is just, just great to learn about it and hear all the things that you've been doing. Thank you. All right. Our next um, presenter, okay, come on slides. <laughs> okay, 
Our next presenter is Kwesa. Um, I am really excited about this because I've only known about Kwesa because of the farmers market at the Embarcadero. So like learning more about what they do as an organization has been a joy for me. Um, Christine Farron is the executive director of Kwesa, a nonprofit dedicated to growing thriving communities through the power and joy of local food by operating farmers markets and education programs. She is responsible for managing Quesa's overall operations and performance, implementing, implementing policies and deliverables set by the board of directors and leading Quesa to achieve annual goals and objectives. Christine feels that shopping at a farmer's market is one of the most life-affirming and community building activities possible and enjoys interfacing with numerous members of the food community here in San Francisco. She holds a BA in American Studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz. So welcome, Christine. Thank you, Soka, uh, Soko, and thank you, um, San Francisco Department of the Environment for hosting the conversation. It was really lovely to hear from Charlotte and Adam. So thanks for all the information you shared before. I love how we went from a very um, international focus to a national focus to now Quesa and who we are uh, regionally and locally here in San Francisco and the work that we're doing within the food system and specifically with food recovery and with food access. So next slide, please. Um, Soko already shared our mission, but I feel like it's always great to just ground in like, what are we doing as an organization? Why are we here? Why do we exist? And that, that growing, thriving communities part is really key. Um, it used to be about supporting farmers and educating people. And we realized that not only was that kind of a bifurcated approach and we wanted to integrate it, but it was really about what's underneath all of that. And that's healthy, thriving communities. And how we do that is through food. Um, next slide, please. So the project that we're best known for is what everyone knows us for, which is great. It's the farmer's market. So we've been operating the Ferry Plaza Farmer's Market since 1992 as a one-time pop-up. And then 1993, um, we've kind of moved around as there have been renovations along the Embarcadero. But that's our flagship location. And we operate those farmer's markets three times a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the weekdays um, from 10 to 2, Saturdays from 8 to 2. During COVID, the weekday markets have really been um, struggling. And it makes sense. We've lost... Uh, our downtown just financial district workers, chefs who were shopping in abundance and needed to resupply weekday and tourists. So right now we have been incredibly grateful for every local shopper who's decided to, you know, put don the mask, leave the house and come out and still continue to support their farmers. Um, next slide, please. We started operating the Mission Community Market. We were asked to take it over. It was started by a group of wonderful volunteers who realized that in order to keep the market going, they wanted to bring in uh, sort of a management group. And so we took over the Mission Community Market and have been really uh, thrilled to be, to continue to steward that community connection that was already existing. And that market operates on Thursday afternoons from three to seven and is on 22nd and Bartlett Street and operates, it's a seasonal market, but it's a really long season. So we run that market March through November. Next slide, please. Um, the part that people don't know us about as much as our education programs. So we have them both for youth and adults and they're very community based. So the, the feeling is the knowledge is in the community and it's not top down. So yes, we are gonna have experts that'll come in to teach about a particular topic, but the general focus of the class is, and the, and the idea behind all the classes is the wisdom is in the community and how do we share that? Because when we're sharing knowledge, we're also sharing power. Um, but everybody needs inspiration and connection. I do, I've worked for Quesa for a long time and I still pull out uh, cookbooks for inspiration and watch our, um, look through our website for recipes and our seasonality charts. Um, so I love that, that we're all, we're all in a different place in learning how to cook for ourselves and we always need inspiration and there's always more to learn. So we host thousands of, atten um, of attendees for cooking demos. They're usually free, um, the hands-on classes are low cost. This is also, of course, all pre-COVID. Um, next slide, please. Uh, obviously during COVID, we had to um, really shift and move a lot of our programs, which I'll talk about. So just to give a sense of context, um, we have about 130 farms that participate in our market um, and food crafters, uh, about 100,000 shoppers on the weekdays or who, who visit our market every week, over 300 chefs, 
um, representing so many amazing restaurants that buy from the farmers. And that's been really key because they'll buy in a large quantity and they'll also, um, they'll come whether it's rain or shine. So um, we love having them as a part of our constituency. And then over 3000 youth come to our free programs. Next slide, please. Um, so there's our team. You can pass on to the next one. We're a small group. We're 16 people. That's all of us with our masks in the wintertime taking a photo. Um, so how did we respond to COVID? Um, well, first was actually advocating to keep the farmer's market open because there were some really scary moments last year at this time where there was concern that um, COVID could be a more transmissible um, in the dense environment of a farmer's market. And we, we had to really advocate for that it's outdoors and change a bunch of things about how far apart we space everyone and all of that. So here we are, a year later, we've managed to keep our markets open and really rally that they're essential and that they're a healthy place to shop. Um, lots of adaptations for customer safety, and that has been key. Next slide. So food access is something that's really a key part of farmers markets that I don't think a lot of people realize how much they're a lifeline. So they're a lifeline for the small scale farmers that are selling at farmers markets. And they're also hugely important for people who are on any kind of um, food assistance programs. So EBT, electronic benefits transfers or SNAP, supplemental nutrition education program, all these acronyms, right? They're just about helping people who are under resourced who need food. Those programs doubled in their usage during COVID. Um, we actually have a program called Market Match, where if you are a recipient of CalFresh, which is California Food Assistance Dollars, you can you know, swipe your card, take uh, $10 out of your account and get it matched for an additional $10 for free for fruits and vegetables. That program went through the roof and we saw people deliberately coming back every market day so they could get that match. So they were willing to take their time to come to the market. That's how strong the need was for fresh food the, on their tables. And then we've also partnered with new programs like Eat SF, or excuse me, Eat SF program, which is through SF General Hospital. And that's part of the Women um, WIC, Women, Infants and Children program that is also a federal program. So farmers markets are key. They're like a scaffolding that, that supports so many different parts of the way that, that the food system interacts. They're also a wonderful way to how we connect with each other. And uh, someone was brave enough to mention the loneliness that we're all experiencing right now. And I'm here to tell you, you know, I feel it too, even though I've been going into the office every day and I get have the privilege of being at the farmer's market and connecting. But I feel like, you know, there's a status, there's a stat that says that at a grocery store, now with self-checkout, you might not talk to anyone. Or if you click online and order through Instacart, you're not talking to anyone. Um, maybe you'll talk to one person, the person who's checking out your groceries, if someone's helping you do that. At a farmer's market, you will have 10 to 12 interactions. You will talk to strangers. You will be asking for advice. There is a whole fabric of community connection that is really wonderful at a farmer's market. And I really appreciate that. Um, and really, I'm here to say that farmer's markets are not just for people who are middle and high income, that farmer's markets are absolutely, and we have, Quasa has a lot of work to do in terms of even just making sure our signage is in multiple languages and is more inclusive. And so um, it's, it's key that farmer's markets are important and they have room to grow into being more, even more inclusive spaces and less white spaces. Um, next slide, please. So, um, along with food access is food recovery, which a lot of people have talked about. So we partner with um, both food runners and SF Community Fridge. So any farms who have produce that would then go back and they would compost on their farm, they're able to donate. And then food runners is an entirely volunteer run. I think they have like two paid staff people um, who will pick up the produce and then deliver it to lots of different kitchens and food banks. Um, so like I said, the farmer's market is this scaffolding um, where everyone comes together and how do we sort of build on those existing resources. And that panel, uh, the pretty um, turquoise one is a part of a whole series called the food change. And so this is one where we were highlight, we wanted to highlight people in the food system that were making positive change to really like lead with hope. And so the, this is our zero waste panel. Next slide. Man, 10 minutes goes fast and I wanna make sure you guys have time for Sochi after this. So I'm gonna hurry myself through. Um, two things we did in the pandemic. So farmers, um, small scale farmers could not just immediately pivot and go start selling to a Whole Foods or a Safeway or something along those lines. They, they grow for direct marketing and it would be really hard for them to all of a sudden start on these long contracts. They lost sales. So what could we do? So Clayton jumped in, we set up an online store for produce delivery, and farmers were able to recoup that income and the people were able to buy that. That program was really geared towards more financially well-resourced people. So it was a great program. 
basically paid for itself. And now we're looking at moving it online in partnership with another company. Um, but we're glad we did it. But at the same time, it really gives me um, great respect for the people that manage all of those logistics. Okay, next slide. Um, what we also started was a program called Feed Hospitality, where we were able to give free produce boxes to out of work hospitality professionals. You know, if there's any industry that was so uniquely hurt by this, it's people who work in restaurants, bars, and hotels. And so this program was born out of a close relationship that we have with spirit companies. They couldn't sponsor parties anymore. And they were like, well, hey, how about you, you know, sponsor these boxes of food? And so the farmer wins and the bar out of work bartender wins. And it's just been a great program. And um, we're going to be able to keep running it at least through the end of the summer. Next slide. Hope the idea is that when the need subsides a little bit, then we can wind down the program, but we're learning the meat and the need might not be subsiding for a long time. Okay, youth programming, near and dear to my heart. Um, we have two programs. Uh, the one that we adapted during COVID was the teen program because we could move it to distance learning through Zoom, but we still kept the farmer's market work days. So the teens were still having to show up engage with one another, engage with customers, learn all of these transferable life and job skills, but also really be connected to food and learn about cooking and sharing food with each other. The elementary school program was a little slower to translate because it's really hard to be teaching cooking to kindergartners through television, but we're working on it. And we're also thrilled that by August, um, we're hopeful that they'll be back in the classroom and able to, to take field trips again. Okay, next slide. And the Food Waste Teens program is one where they were, they were previously growing food in their school gardens and then selling it at the farmer's markets. And we translated that to the where they were growing food at home in their grow boxes and then eating it. And so we transitioned from a, like a grow to sell aspect of teaching about food systems to grow to eat and then working in the farmer's market and other capacities. The idea is like, you, how do we find the solution, right? So what have we learned? Farmers markets, we always know they were essential, now we really know they're essential. And they're essential to local food systems because they're nimble, they can adapt quickly, um, they're resilient, and they're very community focused, right? The problem, as, as the previous speakers have said, the problem feels so big. So how do we narrow in and focus on like what's in our, what's, you have to have that big vision, but what can you tactically do and farmers markets are really great. I also want to say, like, I would love to hear in the chat from people telling me their favorite farmers markets. I grew up in Sacramento going to the one under the WX freeway. Um, that was a great community market. Alamany is near and dear to my heart because it was one of the, the first in the city, part of the city farmers market. A civic center is awesome. They serve such diverse clientele that are so in need of food. So like, you know, then there's Clement Street, like there's so many markets, right? They all have their own little flavor. So I love it. If, okay, I saw an Alamany, Heart of the City, Mission Ricardo. I love it. See, you people, you guys are my people, even though I can't see your faces. Um, I'm definitely um, farmer's market agnostic when it comes to which ones are the best. I love mine and I love all the others too. Okay, so food systems are regional. You just have to support yours because it matters. Call to action. Oh, that's fine. And the other thing about local economy, I mean, I think we all realize the money cycles, all the studies show you supported a farmer's market, you shop in a market, then you're gonna shop at the local stores, the ones that have survived, you know, the death of retail is pretty tragic right now. Um, but there are still many, many retail places. You keep your money in your local economy, you keep the jobs in your local economy when you're buying locally, and it just makes a difference. So we have something on the Coisa website, I'll um, post it in a minute if I can, I'm still not great at talking and adding to the chat. It's a growth, it's my, my growth edge on this one. Um, we have, a, a tips and lists and every, you know, I want to say like, yes, love your leftovers, eat in the order of when you bought things, you know, the freezer is your friend, learn to label. There's so many great tips out there, but what actually helps us make behavior change? And it's hard. And so I feel like the thing to, to take away from this is um, change is hard and you have to have the mindset that I can do hard things. And it might not seem that hard to label something or to stick the, the things that's gonna expire first to the front of your fridge, you know, but those small changes over time will matter because right now I'm just talking about the individual change that you can make to, to reduce how much food that would go into your compost. I'm, I'm definitely not um, dissuading against the importance of all the institutional and structural changes that need to happen, the way the larger companies have to measure and have the metrics in place for what they're they're tossing, and all you know it takes all slices of the pie. But since the farmers market definitely deals with individual consumers, I'm sort of speaking to the individual person at home, like me, who goes shopping, gets excited by everything, buys too much, and lets half of it rot. Like I do that, and it's criminal, right? So how do I not 
um, make that a part of my, and especially now that we're not cooking for as many people or having as many people over. So lots of like, you know, life skills that even we as adults are working on. Um, so, uh, and I saw someone put something in the chat about a buddy that just popped up. I love that idea. Um, I also love the idea of like a uh, prep team. You know, each person does, does one piece of a meal and you prep for the week. I've definitely tried that on a few times and it's been great. So next slide, I wanna make sure there's time for Sochi, the end. Uh, thanks, I really appreciate getting to share this with everyone and I appreciate everyone who's gone to their local farmer's markets. Fantastic, Christine, thank you. That was amazing. I, you know, I really resonate with what you're saying. Um, we, we think that things are hard and if we just take the time, we can make it easier and I think every individual can make a difference. So, yep, that's what we all need to do. Okay, our final presenters, and I'm excited about them as well. I've been excited about everyone. I think this Saturday just makes me really excited, um, is Stewards of Urban Nutrition Network. And I just learned about them during the SF Green New Deal and heard them speak and was just so blown away that I really wanted them to be part of this panel series. So today we have Jen and Sochi who are going to be presenting about Sun. Jen is first generation Chinese American born and raised on Ramatush Ohlone land, also known as San Francisco. She began growing food for her community to address social injustices fueled by the industrial agricultural system. Through her work, she is blessed to experience urban, farmers, urban farms as spaces where life from all ages, diverse backgrounds, speaking different languages come together to rejuvenate the earth, feed and grow community with each other. Jed is currently an urban farmer with Sun, spending most of her time at Hummingbird Farm, learning from and fighting for a future that lets everyone fulfill, fulfill their potential. <clears throat> and then Sochi works on cross-pollinating traditional ecological knowledge, queer politics, and indigenous philosophies to connect the dots between decolonial botany and queer liberation. Sochi is the farm manager at Hummingbird Farm, a collective organization, six acre farm in the Excelsior District in San Francisco. As an urban camp, I hope I said that right, <laughs> and artist Sochi raises awareness on the importance of flowers as resistance tool, tools to colonialism and climate chaos while healing the bodies and spirits of queer and trans people of color. Sochi works on intercropping on the decolonization of flowers and queer ecology into the discussion and organizing of sustainable agriculture, environmental justice, and climate chaos. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow Sochi to share his screen with you all. Looking that out. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, Good morning. Let me get this up. All right. So um, we are here, Jen and I are here both to talk about uh, Stewards of Urban Nutrition, which is a new organization that um, it's, it's, a, um, it's a network coalition that really was built out of uh, what was happening out of COVID. So um, there's three official representation, Urban Sprouts, which works with, um, has five school gardens around the South San Francisco area, Alamini Farm, which I believe is a four acre farm and then Hummingbird Farm, um, which is a six acre farm um, in Excelsior. And so when we first started, when we first formed um, and came together as, or, and as organizations, it was at the beginning of COVID when we were trying to figure out what was, you know, what do we do as farmers in, this, in the midst of all this chaos of like not knowing what's safe, what isn't safe. And so our first conversations were really just farm safety uh, discussions of, of what, how do we move forward and trying to grow food? Urban Sprouts, uh, you know, they were working within schools and the schools were shut down and they had all this infrastructure. Um, they had beds, they had irrigation lines, they had plants growing, but then they, they you know, they were put on pause like the rest of us. Um, and same thing with Alamini and Hummingbird. So we came together and we started really discussing like what is, uh, the how do we move forward with this and through that we we were really uh came 
to re to realize that food um food was a way to both organize our communities but also to help back and give back um so um I just want to talk a little bit about each organization before I move on. Urban Sprouts promotes the flourishing of historical marginalized populations in San Francisco through five of their gardens. Um, and they reach about 2,000 people each year. Friends, um, well, Alamany Farm uh, grows about 25,000 pounds of food um, and it's free, fresh, uh, organic produce. And then um, they give around their, their neighborhood and their constituents. And then Boded, out of these three farm structures, uh, Hummingbird Farm is the, is the youngest. Um, and so one of the things that Poder did as an organization, they started um, working on food distribution to people in the in the neighborhood. Um, and we can't hear you. The COVID brought us together and then we started figuring out, okay, how do we build from this? What are the adaptations that we need to, to do um, to really let us survive and, and move through the rest of this um, paradigm shift that we were all going through together? Um, so as of now, we're growing, gathering and distributing our produce um, and trying to give it to our neighbors um, who are experiencing the highest food insecurity as a result of, of COVID. Our vision is to help community in the context of food production while growing the next generation of eco farmers. And so um, that is really what we're, we're, not only are we trying to really uh, address food security, but what are the foundational blocks we can work with our youth so that they can not just look at food production as part of the future, but um, take their own personal dreams and desires and, uh, and aspirations and integrate food carbon sequestration um, into what that looks like. Um, through partnerships of low, no cost um, internships, um, we've been able to teach small cohorts and we're trying to expand that a little bit more um, to really build a deep relationship with the land, sow seeds of environmental stewardship, facilitate the revival of ancestral foodways, promote food sovereignty and break ground on new green spaces in the south uh, east part of the city. Um, so, um, Jen will go on this one. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stop my video. I think my internet's a little spotty, so it might be better for me to not be cut off. Okay, so how did our organization pivot during COVID-19? As Sochi mentioned, we are a coalition formed during the onset of the pandemic to address an amplified food shortage issue um, that we noticed happening amongst our communities. Uh, when COVID first started, I was uh, working as an urban farmer helping out at food pantries in the Tenderloin. Uh, and we noticed a lot less food coming in and a lot more people showing up. So what we realized was that the Band-Aid, which are, you know, our food pantries, uh, the Band-Aid on our broken food system was coming off and that we really needed to be able to set up a more secure food system. And so other members of Sun, who are all amazing community workers also noticed too that our black indigenous people of color or BIPOC identified communities were disproportionately affected by food shortages. Uh, community living in Southeast San Francisco who were already experiencing difficulty accessing healthy food due to historic and contemporary systematic inequalities we're also now in the front lines of an unprecedented um, food insecurity crisis. So we forecast this food insecurity crisis continuing for at least the next six months, and it will likely, you know, be well into the next two years. Um, and in order to address this issue, we are using our farms to grow and distribute healthy local organic food to build a more secure local food system and to meet the needs of our community. So more than just feeding our communities, uh, our coalition also identifies this as an opportunity to start providing free and accessible education about growing food and plant medicine so that community members who are most affected by food insecurity are able to produce healthy foods, uh, healthy fruits, vegetables, 
for themselves, uh, boosting food security and health in the near and also long-term um, effects of COVID-19. Uh, so currently our coalition has been um, together doing this work for uh, one year um, and we've recorded successful collaborations in the relationship building phase of our movement building, but we still have a lot of work to do in the realm of uh, building out our infrastructure um, over the next six months. Um, and what is happening as places begin to open? Uh, so she will continue with that. Okay. So um, what is happening now is, is as spaces begin to open, we are still trying to grow food. Um, and we are, again, using our spaces to um, welcome people in, show them the importance of, um, of, of why these spaces need to exist, but really integrate like how food production, green spaces is part of the solutions to the climate uh, crisis that we're all in right now. Um, COVID is just one element of how imbalanced we are at, at an ecosystem level. Um, it's not the virus's fault that we had to shut down our economic uh, systems. It's the way the economic economic systems have set up, and you know, as we can see, as Jen mentioned, that band aid of care that you that was on the surface came off, and all the the true wounds of the system is is, is exposed. So, um, we are still uh, working together. Um, we recently started hosting Ask a Farmer online, um, so it's a way for us to, to take the expertise of our of our coalition and offer it as a resource to the community. Uh, we've been doing the first Saturday of the month, I believe. Um, but, and we are, um, we're also looking at how to create a joint apprenticeship program so that we can have youth um, work at all three of our sites um, and help us better weave our collaboration by bringing their experiences and their questions and, and um, to really help us create a, a better notice the picture here to the right was at a, a recent uh, women's empowerment event. Um, and that was the first time we've had that big of a crowd. Um, and people were ready, you know, everyone was wearing masks, you know, we, uh, we had washing stations everywhere, but it was a really great way to integrate the, the growing spaces with the community and um, also just share what we're doing and the role that um, local farms have in navigating the climate chaos. Um, we're currently trying to uh, work on our, our local food resource guide to have a little bit more um, direct information of how people can take this information and grow in their own home, grow um, in spaces around them, um, whether it's food production or flowers. We're really trying to uh, integrate this idea of carbon sequestration um, on a more personal level. Like what are the, the commitments that we can make as individuals to help sequester carbon in, in our spaces? Um, so, Cal, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we're trying to do with this online resource guide, we're trying to include a BIPOC um, led or gardening how to videos, cooking videos, uh, just education videos. Um, and have a space for people to, ha you know, come ask us. Um, you know, we're, we're building a third project that will begin in July, hopefully. Um, and then we're, with that, we're hoping to have, um, we, we did have a few uh, breakfast programs or breakfast kitchens, um, and we're really trying to expand a little bit more on that. It really, um, part of the, the, the barriers that we're having is just resources. You know, we're, a lot of us are, are 
trying to do this on the side, um, on top of trying to sustain ourselves and then trying to give what we, the surplus to the community. Um, best practices. Um, for best practices and our lessons learned um, since coming together, uh, we've got quite a few, but the first is, and most importantly, that the community knows what's best for community. So the members of our coalition, we've all been in community work um, with organizations uh, that are on the ground and who already have an established relationship with the community members um, to identify needs, right? And so this ensures what we're doing is helpful and necessary. And so I can't emphasize the importance uh, of working um, with community enough um, because how do you how do you serve right without giving um, the mic and um, space and power to the communities that you're serving um, community powered is the solution so a lot of work at hummingbird farm are is powered by volunteers right and folks living in the local area already um, and also because we have a lot of elders uh, visit the space, um, there's a lot of information sharing, um, there's a lot of trading in trad traditional ancestral methods about how to cultivate land, how to grow food. This helps us diversify our methods, um, which our methods and our foods, right? And so that lends to a more stable uh, food system because we have we're not just working with like one methodology right there's multiple techniques and information being shared within mm -hmm. our farm spaces that makes it um, a more you know uh, resilient space um, and collaboration is important to spread limited resources right so again like our coalition um, started from, you know, we're all volunteers, right? And so uh, Sun is made up of Alamany Farm, Hummingbird Farm, Urban Sprouts, um, and other local farmers, right? We're all sharing skills, we're all sharing our time, we're all sharing um, food, how to grow food and ideas. Um, and we're, we've also been very grateful to be able to work with other farms that aren't directly within San Francisco, right? The Permaculture Skills Center in Sebastopol has been donating starts to Hummingbird Farm throughout the pandemic. So shout out to them. Uh, we have a lot of our uh, spring and summer vegetables in the ground because farmers are willing to share their resources to so that we can grow food in different areas, right? And create abundance of food in different areas. Um, and uh, food security and um, building a more sustainable and responsible food system really takes the work and effort of everybody. Um, so any walk of life, coming into the farm, sharing their time, their hands, it makes a really significant impact on the work and the amount of food that we're able to grow in these spaces. Um, and so really getting the involvement of everyone in our community um, to keep sharing what we're doing, to keep you know amplifying the importance of this work and why people should care um, is really, really important to keep this work going. Um, yeah, um, let's keep doing this. Yeah. All right, with that, our calls to action, um, you know, Play. Our food choices impact the people and the land, whether they're workers, you know, restaurants, farmers, farm workers, um, you know, and then the, the practices of how that food and, and those flowers are, are grown. Um, physical commitments. If any of you are in the San Francisco area, come and, you know, occupy the Lonely Territory, come visit us. Um, volunteer at one of our working farms or volunteer at a local garden. Again, getting your hands in the soil directly is, is just, that's a 
taking thoughts and turning them into action. Um, and then if, you know, for the folks that are able, resource investment, um, you know, with our collaborative effort, we have, we were able to do what we've done is by spreading our, our limited resources. Um, and so, um, you know, it, when we have volunteers, you know, whether we just give them something quick to eat or, or you're providing uh, something to make them feel comfortable, sunscreen, all that takes resources, um, you know, we're limited, we're working on limited infrastructure, so we don't really have a greenhouse, irrigation system isn't up to date, um, and then just building all this stuff needs materials, we need seeds, compost, veg, you know, veg starts, etc. And then staff, um, you know, this is more like bigger asking, but you know, there might be someone on this call that can help with that. Um, and, and just, you know, when we're working on all this, we're really working on the next generation. We really want to help integrate this uh, understanding of where growing plants and organizing together is part of the solution. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, G, I know you cut out, so it was awesome. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but thank you all to our, our panelists. I hope you all um, have enjoyed the conversations. Um, we do have a few minutes. I, I see most of the questions have been answered in the, in the chat, but if any of you have like final thoughts, questions, comments that you'd like to share. Um, please put them in the chat and I can respond. Uh, I just want to say that I like feel really honored to have been on um, the call with you all today on this panel. I, I've learned so much. I, I thought I knew some stuff. I, I think it's good though, like always learning and growing from different um, communities and organizations and partners. Um, it helps us understand that we're not in our own bubble and we need to work collaboratively and it talks about diversity, right? Like we're all doing the same, we all have the same goal, we're all doing it differently. And that's really important because there's no one size fits all. Um, yeah. So Alexa, any final thoughts? Any of our panelists, do you have any final thoughts, parting words, things that you'd like to share? If not, I can give you all back your time and your Saturday. Sure, I'll, I'll just share real quick a couple observations. Um, first of all, thank you. You all are doing wonderful work. I just commend you. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, but yeah, just to summarize some of the themes I heard um, were, you know, we're all trying to repair and heal this food system. We're all working on it on a sort of different angle. Um, so food waste, obviously reduction and getting food to people in need and growing food. And so it's, it's just beautiful to see that there's so many different approaches to how we heal our food system, our food web, and we need everybody. And um, the somebody um, made a comment about, we're all working on a jigsaw puzzle, right? And within our community, and we know we're all working together um, is, is great to know. And, and then the second thing was obviously food justice, but I was thinking, yeah, food access, healthy food access to all people, you know, justice to the people, but, and also justice to the food, right? How do we really learn to really respect our food more? Um, I appreciate Christine talking about you, you yourself working this space, we overbuy and sometimes don't utilize it. So like, how do we all really learn to honor our food more? Um, so justice to food, justice to the people. And then the last thought was, um, you know, all the co-benefits, everyone brought this up, but it was pretty remarkable to hear, you know, food, working in the space, we alle help alleviate the loneliness we're all experiencing and we build community. So that was pretty cool to see all of you talking about that, um, especially in, during this pandemic. So um, thank you again. And I don't know if there's any more comments or questions in the chat. So go. Taking a look now, great. Um, okay. See, thanks. Julian said that, wanted to share this regarding Olio. I found out 
about the app via presenter at one of our neighborhood association meetings here in San Francisco. That person might have been an ambassador. She gave a presentation on how to use the app and I now have it on my phone, which is awesome. And yes, thank you, Nina, for being here, like saying that we need more discussions like this. We really do. I think thinking about community, like we, we need to take it to the next level where we incorporate community because community does know best. So how are we keeping it local? How are we engaging our community? How are we collaborating together and tying all the pieces of the puzzle together? I really appreciate Sochi talking about carbon sequestration. It's not just us talking about it at the Department of the Environment anymore, <laughs> which is great and refreshing. Really appreciate that because you're connecting the dots in a different way that maybe we would not be able to. So really appreciate it. Um, yeah, just, I appreciate everyone being here today. So with that, I know one of my colleagues, Bree, just put in a survey. So before you all leave today, please, please complete our survey for us. Other than that, just, check out the rest of our, um, oh, who's speaking? Sorry. It's Anissa. Yes. Go ahead, Anissa. And just thank you all. I want to, I mean, there was so much like overlap between us, really, our organizations and everybody out there serving the community. We're all doing the same work. And if we can do it together, how powerful could we really be? Be amazing. Mm -hmm. And yes, just so many, like the Band-Aids being ripped off of so many things, us, you. So yeah, I, I appreciate you all being here and sharing your knowledge and um, all of our power together. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, it's amazing. I'm feeling very energized now. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, oh yes, <laughs> they've got so much work to do, but I feel reinvigorated mm -hmm. to do it. Yes. <laughs> On a Saturday, even better. <laughs> yes, I'm glad that you're inspired. Yes, okay. So with that, I am going to close us out. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you um, for doing this work with us. And, you know, the environment is about not just, it's about people and it's about, you know, nature. So I think we should really remember that, that we are the environment. It's not just human beings and then the environment I think the pandemic has taught us that, but I think as we come out of this pandemic, it's really important that we remember that, right? And this is just the beginning. So thank you all again. Have a good Saturday and the rest of your weekend.